duty, honor, country dictate what you ought to be, what you can be, what you will be. The destiny of man is not measured by material computations. When great forces are on the move in the world, we learn we're spirits, not animals. Now, we are the masters of our fate. Howdy, gents, and welcome to another episode of the Wolf and Iron podcast. I'm Mike Yarbrough, founder and curator of wolfandiron.com and your host for this episode. I want you to take a moment with me here and imagine yourself in the following scenario. You're out and about, maybe you're with your family, you're having a normal day, maybe you're visiting your kids at school or you're at the movies or you're out shopping and all of a sudden you hear this. What do you do? Do you run? Do you fight? Do you hide? And what if your kids are with you? Unfortunately, this scenario is becoming more and more common as terrorist groups ramp up their attacks or we have some guy on too many meds that has lost his job or his girlfriend and he wants to take it out on the rest of the world. My guest for this episode is Aaron Janetti, and I first found out about Aaron from a video Glenn Beck posted on Facebook regarding an active shooter course that Aaron and his team teach. It's designed to help you and I know what to do if we were to find ourselves in such a scenario. And as it turns out, Aaron's an all-around awesome guy. He has skills in a number of self-defense disciplines, such as Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu and Krav Maga. He's a competitive CrossFit guy, a powerlifter, a skilled firearms instructor. Plus, he's married and recently became a dad. In short, he's the kind of guy you want to have on your team. You can find out more about Mr. Gennetti by going to wolfandiron.com forward slash 003. Let's welcome him to the podcast. Mr. Aaron Gennetti, thank you so much for taking the time to speak with me today. Oh, well, my pleasure, man. Looking forward to it. So now you're out in uh, California, is that right? Uh, actually, no. I'm actually in Columbus, Ohio. Oh, you're in Ohio. Uh, we, okay. Yeah. So we've, uh, we've done some courses and a lot of trainings and things like that out in California. Um, but yeah, we're actually based uh, right here in central Ohio. Okay. Well, since we're on the subject, give me, uh, give all of us an update or uh, some information on um, wife, kids, um, you know, kind of your backstory and that kind of stuff. Help us to get to know you a little bit. Yeah, for sure. Um, So I am married. Um, We've been married a little bit over about a year, year and a half now, but uh, we've been together for eight and a half. So we've been together for quite a while. She, believe it or not, was actually one of my students at uh, the original gym I opened up a long time ago. So <laughs> the whole, uh, the whole don't crap where you eat policy kind of went out the window with that one. Right, but, uh, right. it, turned, it turned into a solid marriage, so can't complain. But, um, but we actually have, I have uh, one son. He actually just turned four weeks yesterday. So, All right. uh, or Tuesday. Yeah. So I got one month old. That's and, great. Uh, Congratulations. Right now. Thank you, sir, very much. So that's our first. And um, so yeah, married, got one kid, um, essentially, you know, teach self-defense and strength conditioning full time. And it's pretty much my passion, man. I just, I love teaching. I love getting out and meeting new people. Yeah. So I, uh, you know, I'm just, uh, I'm imagining all kinds of scenarios for how you and your wife met, uh, I'm imagining her <laughs> like kicking you in the face or doing something really yeah. impressive. And you were just like, man, this is the girl for me. How did that come <laughs> well, up? How did that come about? Funny story. I actually, like, I, I, I don't know what it is, but I can vividly remember the day that she took her introductory course. And it, it wasn't like it was anything crazy or anything special. She just, she's a little firecracker, man. She's, uh, <laughs> she's got a little Irish blood in her herself. So she's yeah. a little, you know, a little angry mixed with a little bit of awesome all together. But, right. um, we, uh, funny story with her beating me up. We had already been dating for a little while, but she's actually the first person to ever break my nose. Like, so full time. <laughs> wow fighting you know I've, I've done a cage fight i've done plenty of jiu-jitsu tournaments i've done yeah. countless hours of sparring and she was actually the first person to break my, <laughs> break my nose during uh one of her testing things in krav maga and she just she lit me up right through the pipe with a uh actually an open hand palm strike of all things and Jeez. It, you would have thought that it shocked me you should have seen the look on her face like her eyes shot open like oh my god i'm so sorry and i was like no it was great so yeah she's a firecracker man she uh she, she trained for a long time in Krav Maga. She uh, actually was a, one of my instructors for a little while. 
and um, she's a kettlebell instructor as well. So she's she shares the same passion on all this kind of stuff that I do. So it was kind of hit it off right out of the gate. Yeah, that's really good. That sounds like that's that's uh, going to be a good start for you guys. And they oh, say the, yeah. the first marriage is uh, the first year of marriage is always the toughest. I've been uh, we're on our twenty years now, so I can. Oh man, congratulations! I, thanks. Uh, I can definitely say that it. Uh, there are parts where it gets easier, and there's parts where it gets tougher. But as long as yeah. you're willing to to put in the work, you know you'll reap the re- rewards there. So that's great. Oh yeah, I mean she she supports the heck out of me, man. And I've got a crazy hectic schedule, and you know she's amazing about it, and we we do really well together. So I don't I don't think she's getting rid of me anytime soon. Okay, <laughs> that's good. Um, before we jump into any of the details on exactly yeah. you know what you do. Uh, you do a lot of stuff with martial arts. You do a lot of stuff with um, physical fitness and, and just body conditioning, mm-hmm. uh, as well as, as self defense. So, uh, tell us how you got started in that. What, what was the draw to all of that? Yeah, I um, when I was a kid, um, you know, I had kind of taken the same route that a lot of kids do. You know, I took a little bit of like the karate for kids type stuff. So, you know, I, I started that way. But then there was a huge gap where I really didn't do much outside of you know, maybe get into a couple of scuffles that my friends got me into. Yeah. But, um, I found Krav Maga in, uh, like, oh gosh, eight and a half, nine years ago. Now I was actually attending Ohio state university at the time. It was my fourth year there. And you know, I tell people all the time, it was kind of the right place, right time. Mm-hmm. Fell in my lap. Like you can't really say, you know, anything better about destiny, but I, I literally, I was paying my way through college. I ran out of money had to take a quarter off. So I was working, you know, five jobs just to raise enough money to go back to school. I didn't know if I even wanted to do anything with the the degree I was getting. And so it's kind of in a really, really weird kind of down place where nothing in life felt right. And I actually was watching that old show that used to be on um, Spike, a human weapon. Yeah. And they did a little bit on Krav Maga. Well, during that, they actually uh, had a commercial for a local facility that was called Ohio Krav Maga. And, uh, so I went, you know what, screw it. I'm going to go, I'm going to take a class and just see if I enjoy it. I got nothing else to do. So I walked in, I took my first intro class and just immediately fell in love. Um, I literally walked out and handed him a check that wasn't even sure if it was going to (laughs) clear and was like, look, I'll be back tomorrow. And, uh, I just kind of, man, I was there seven days a week, every single class they offered. I'd get there, you know, an hour early and jog around the building until they opened the doors and the guy who owned it. Um, his name was Mark Slane, you know, really cool guy, took me underneath his wing, you know, taught me a lot about Krav Maga, you know, bought me my first gi to get me into jiu-jitsu, you know, paid my first membership to get into CrossFit. He really took care of me. Yeah. And I just, it kind of, I just, I never left, you know, as I fell so in love with it, I started teaching it for him full time and then opened up my first facility alongside of him in 2008 and have just been teaching full time ever since, so. Would you say that um, that you're sort of a, a go all in kind of guy, passionate about you know things? You, you give it your all, or is it, or is that yeah. something? That can, yeah, probably to a fault. <laughs> well, <laughs> some some would maybe say to a fault. Like if if we're gonna do something, man, I'm, I'm kind of one of those guys that I don't need a huge plan. You know, yeah. I kind of look at it and go, I bet I can make that work. Let's do it. And I dive head first. And it's funny because you know Kimberly, my wife, she's the total opposite. She's a planner. She wants everything laid out, wants to know where everything is. And I'm kind of the guy that's like, Hey, look, we have A, B and C resources and we'll just figure the rest of it out. And we just kind of dive into it. So I don't think I knew that, uh, until I started getting really into this, but now, especially as a business owner, you know, we run massive competitions every year for CrossFit and weightlifting. And we kind of, instead of taking the local route where it's like, I oh, will invite 10 or 15 lifters and we'll make it just this fun little thing. Like, Day one, we were like, okay, we're going to come up with, you know, eight grand in cash prizes and we're going to reach out to the top national lifters and like, yeah. you know, we kind of came out of nowhere. So yeah, some people would, would say it's probably to a fault and I annoy the crap out of people with it, but that's just kind of how we go after it. I figure you only live once and you yeah. got to go after what you want to do. Well, and, and particularly in your profession, uh, right. there's, there's a certain intensity that people expect to, for there to be from you and from, I guess, other teachers yeah. as well. You know, nobody, mm-hmm. nobody wants to go, uh, well, I'm not going to say no one. There's the, there's the one side of martial arts, which is the peaceful kind of meditative, you know, sort of side right. that, you know, we saw a lot about in the eighties and nineties. And then there's mm-hmm. the, you know, the more of the, Hey, look, I need to be about something and I need to be serious about it. Uh, if I'm right. actually expecting this to actually save my life one day, or if I want to be really competitive in this. So I think, yeah, it's, absolutely. I think it's really good. And I think, uh, you know, if I look at your website, I see the videos and stuff out there. 
that kind of gives you guys give off that definite impression of uh, there's a lot of passion and there's a lot of energy behind what you do. So that's really good. Yeah, we don't we don't teach anything or start a program or anything along those lines that we a aren't really passionate about and b don't feel qualified or have the resources to have a qualified instructor for. So everything we actually do have at the gym, you know, it's stuff we actually care about. We don't just kind of throw things in the mix just for the heck of bringing more people through the door. It's, it's yeah. just, it starts to wear on you and, you know, and the, the people that are coming in and taking it, you're doing them a disservice doing that. So we get, we get pretty passionate about the the programs we host. Yeah. What, what all, uh, tell us about some of the courses that you guys teach. I know you do a couple of things. Yeah. So we um, originally started off, we just mainly taught uh, Krav Maga, which uh, most people know is kind of a hand-to-hand combat system originated through, um, you know, the country of Israel. Mm-hmm. And CrossFit, which pretty much everybody knows for better or worse in some form or fashion, at least a little bit about nowadays. So yeah. those are our two main programs. They still are our two main programs. Um, you know, I, I like to tell people that we're a real old school. We've been doing it for a long time. So we're not necessarily what you would think of when you think of a CrossFit gym where it's just go, 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 no matter what happens. We're real big on, you know, technique, really understanding, really educating our athletes. And we're kind of the same exact way with our um, Krav Maga program where it's not just come in and, you know, boom, 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 go a hundred miles an hour and don't really learn anything. You know, we're intense. We'll drive people in. We'll, we'll push them to their limits, but we're also trying to really make them understand the programs, why they're doing things, when they shouldn't do things. So we started there. Those are still our two main programs, but we also do, uh, we have a fully functional BJJ program that's led by a uh, brown belt, um, Justin Kennedy. We've got um, uh, fight conditioning courses. Uh, they're called Hit Fit. They're pretty much 30 minute uh, options for people to come in, increase their conditioning a little bit, but without some of the contact, um, you don't necessarily have to have a high level of skill to get into that course as well. Yeah. On the other side of the gym, we've got um, Project Lift, which is actually a really, really big barbell program that focuses on Olympic weightlifting. So we've got Holly Mangold, one of the athletes there. So she was Olympian in 2012, and she's taken another stab at 2016 in Rio. Mm. And then we've got uh, Drew Dillon and Chelsea Kyle, the two main instructors there. But we've got a fully functioning barbell program over there. They've got... Gosh, I think they're up to like almost 60 athletes just for Olympic weightlifting alone, which is impressive for a barbell club like that. And then they also reach out and do courses and do a lot of videos and things. They got a pretty good social media presence as well. So, and then outside of the gym, you know, we host a lot of seminars. We travel around and teach courses on mobility and stability. We teach courses on, you know, home invasion, you know, unarmed or armed. We teach firearms courses, concealed carry courses. Um, a little bit of anything that we feel is practical and functional for essentially the everyday person. Yeah, good. And I, and I definitely, uh, here in just a bit, want to talk about some of the active shooter stuff that you guys are doing mm-hmm. and, yeah, uh, for sure. and and dive into that. Um, but first, I, 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 I grew up, so I'm 37 years old, uh, so I was born mm-hmm. in 78. I grew up really through the 80s and the 90s. And it was for me, it was the heyday of martial arts. You had Jean-Claude Van Damme, Steven Seagal. Uh, you know, Bruce Lee was still a popular figure at the time, even though he was, had been dead for a while. Um, right. you know, and, and there were obviously the karate kid. And I mean, if, basically if you weren't kicking somebody in the teeth, you weren't on TV, you know? <laughs> right. So, but then there was also, I, I took Taekwondo, uh, but there was karate available in various forms of that jujitsu, Kung Fu, uh, Wing Chun and, and various things. What was the draw for you, you know, to kind of clear out everything else to say, I wanted to study Krav Maga over and i know you've done some jujitsu and some other things too but what is so what would you recommend that is uh i guess what i'm trying to say is why would people want to seek that out um maybe over some of the the more well-known arts out there yeah you know and that's a that's a huge question that we get a lot in when we do have to address you know i my background i've done you know kali i've done brazilian jujitsu i've done a little bit of japanese jujitsu um you know we've i've done traditional martial arts everything in between the reason that we're so big on Krav Maga is that it started and originated for self-defense mm-hmm. period. You know, a lot of people, they Google Krav Maga and it's the hand to hand combat system for the IDF, but they don't realize like, if you really break that down, when Israel first became a nation, it was essentially ages 18 to 55 years old, male or female. If you had a pulse, you were going to defend your country. Mm-hmm. So it wasn't a selected military system. So it was a hand to hand combat system developed for everybody your couch potato all the way up to your athlete, your, you know, four eleven hundred pound female all the way up to your, you know, six foot two, three hundred pound gargantuan guy. 
So it's a very well-rounded system. They got rid of a lot of the bells and whistles, a lot of the extra additional flashy crap that you find in a lot of other places. And it is, this is easy to learn, easy to remember, very, very quick to pick up. And under stress, this is how you're going to save your life. No frills, no bells and whistles, no nothing. And it's still that way today. Now, it's getting older, and, and you know this, especially, you know, growing up through that martial arts era. As systems get older, they spread. They become a little more watered down. Sure. You'll find one or two sects that come up here and there, and they're maybe not holding true to what the originals are. You're starting to see a little bit of that in Krav Maga, but it's still relatively new. Like, when I first got into Krav Maga, there was two organizations and two organizations, period. Yeah. There was IKMF, which was the International Krav Maga Federation. They were based essentially out of Israel, and you had you know, E.L. Yanwa. And then you had Krav Maga Worldwide, which was essentially the American subsidiary that was run by Darren Levine. And that was it. So if you wanted to get certified in the U.S., 9 times out of 10, you had to go out to Los Angeles. Nowadays, I mean, Lord, I think there might be 25 or 30 Krav Maga organizations, wow. and we're talking over the span of maybe nine years. Sure. So you're going to do a point where, okay, yeah, there might be some programs that are better than others, but it's still a relatively young system that still kind of holds true to roots. So worse comes to worse. If you're looking for just brass tack self-defense, you can't go completely wrong if you find a Krav Maga gym. Okay. Some are going to be better than others, Yeah. but it's, you know, you're not going to find flash. You're not going to find bells and whistles. Very seldom do you even find, you know, uniforms. It's generally wear your street clothes, come in in shorts, whatever you feel comfortable working in, wear your basic shoes, and, you know, let's learn how to protect your family. That's pretty much what drew me to it. Um, and then when you get really good at Krav Maga, the first thing they'll tell you when you get a black belt right out of the gate is, cool, now go get better at something else. Mm. You know, go get a black belt in jiu-jitsu. Go study, you know, knife fighting. Go study, you know, Kali, firearms, all that kind of stuff. Here's your basic self-defense program. You completed all that. Now go get really freaking scary in very specific places. And that's what I think I really respect about a lot of the Krav Maga practitioners these days. Yeah. And I, I noticed uh, something, and this is just anecdotal from when I was a kid. Um, I used to get picked on quite a bit. I started taking Taekwondo. I got decent at it and, and began to get some confidence. And it's interesting. When you begin to get your own self-confidence in a particular skill or basically defending yourself, um, there's a lot less conflict that comes your way. At least is what I found. Oh my God. Yeah. And yes. you know, it's almost, you can almost say it's intuitive, an animalistic kind of instinct thing, but I think it sort of wards off, uh, the crazies from coming your, your direction. Um, yeah. you, wa you walk differently. Absolutely. So you've seen that as well. Oh my gosh. Yeah. You know, one of the, the comments you get all the time when you go out and you teach with different groups and your groups, you get some of the younger guys that'll go, Hey, you know, you know, how many fights have you been in and you know, how many times <laughs> yeah. have you won? Yeah, you, know, you get those type things when you go out a lot. And I, you know, I tell people all the time, I go, look, I can honestly count on one hand, and honestly, I think it's only two instances where I've actually gotten into what would be considered an altercation since I started training. Yeah. Because not only do you, you know, kind of carry your head a little better and, you know, so people don't, aren't looking, they don't see that, you know, I guess those victim signs if you want to look at it, but not only that, but you start to figure out like, Hey, look, first off, even if I win, there's really bad stuff that could happen. If, exactly. if some guy attacks me and it's a, you know, basic like peacocking situation, some guy just trying to be tough, you know, and I punch that guy and he smacks his head on a bar stool and now he's paralyzed. Well, you know, a big ego fight that I could have very easily avoided and walked away from just turned into me spending time in prison. That mm -hmm. guy's screwing up his family and everything in between. You start to realize I've got the tools to get out of these situations, but I really don't ever want to use them, even exactly. if I know I could smoke somebody. So you start avoiding places where you might find yourself in fights. You know, I had an old instructor named John Burton. He always used to say, you know, you don't go stupid places with stupid people that do stupid things. That's so you good. start learning to avoid, yeah, you start learning to avoid certain places and scenarios. When you see scenarios start to bubble over, you start going, okay, cool, let's, you know, give me my check. Let me get the hell out of here before anything bad happens. <laughs> right. <laughs> You really learn to just avoid it. You learn to be a little more aware. People carry or you carry yourself a little better so people don't really pick on you or deal with it. You know, you kind of have that confidence. It's it's good. And I think that's with anything. You know, you yeah. hope that it's not false confidence. But I think when you learn, you know, to take a hit and you know that you can give a hit, you start to carry yourself and go, Okay, cool, look, it might not be fun to fight, but if I ever had to defend myself, you know, I, I at least know I've been there, I know I experienced it. If you don't know where you stand in a fight, I think that's where people start to smell it on you. You know, if you've yeah. never taken a hit, you just don't really know. Right. 
Yeah, and it's, I mean, if you haven't taken a hit, and I know there's going to be a lot of guys that are listening to this that, that haven't taken a hit. Uh, yeah. it, it, it sends your body into a different kind of state that's scary. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Uh, the reaction yeah. to that, you know, getting your getting yourself popped in the nose one good time and your eyes start to water and all that, you know, your, your vision starts to get narrowed. And there's a lot yeah. of things that, that happen. And, you, you know, when you first go to a sparring class or something, you get a chance to mess around with some people and you get somebody socks one on you. It, it, it jars you and you need to be aware yeah. of that, you know? Yeah. It's one of those things like, you know, people like, I don't suggest just going out and getting smacked around. Like <laughs> that's not always the best approach, but go in, start learning your basic skills. You know, with us, we work them in, you know, real close. When we start sparring, we work them in real close and easy. We, we essentially use the sparring methods of a gentleman by the name of Ryan Hoover, who's based out of um, uh, Charlotte, North Carolina. With oh, really? Fight. Okay. And, um, wait, what's that name he, again? Cause he's, that's where uh, I'm at Fits actually. Fight. Ryan yeah, fit to fight. His name is Ryan Hoover. Okay. If you ever get a chance to go train over with the fit to fight guys, is uh, Ryan Hoover, Andre Herbert. Actually, Andre is coming up um, tomorrow. He's going to spend three days with us. You know, getting out and training with a couple of our instructors. But, um, you know, I'm, I'm one of their affiliates. We train with them a lot. But we use a lot of the sparring methodology that that Ryan developed in, where most people would go out and they start their sparring classes with you know two dudes touching up and with striking. He actually does it in the kind of reverse order. Yeah. He'll start people with clinch work because when I'm in really, really, really tight, yeah. I can't really even throw those bomb punches and kicks anyway. Sure. So you start to learn, okay, this is what it feels like for somebody to push me around and pull me around. Okay, this is what it's starting to feel like for somebody to, you know, make a little bit of impact. Mm -hmm. Okay, little by little by little. And then you work them out. By the time they get there and they do take that first punch, they've already got a little bit of confidence. They already kind of know where they're at. They've already slowly built towards that. But you get into that place where you start to learn whether you got a glass jar or not, you yeah. know? Yeah. And once you know whether you're at it, it's not the end of the world if you do have a glass jar, but then you just learn to control a lot better. This is how I need to protect myself. This is how I need to be aware. But until you've taken a punch, I, man, I don't care who you are. I've seen big guys get dropped in a heartbeat, and I've seen, you know, little dudes or older dudes that, you know, you could hit them in the face with a baseball bat, and they just spit blood out and smile at you, you know? It's, you don't know who you are until you get into that mix and kind of figure it out. So yeah. if you get an opportunity, yeah. you know, in a safe, controlled manner, go out and get hit in the face at least once. <laughs> exactly. And you know what? That's good preparation for fatherhood too, because I guarantee yeah. you, your kid's going to kick you in the face at some point, <laughs> you know, or, or headbutt you or something like that. You yeah. Know? He's, you know, he doesn't have really good neck control. So you're holding him and he'll lift his head up and then it'll just flop and he'll headbutt you in the head. And right. Like, oh, right. Yeah. Little, little kid's whooping my butt. <laughs> Well, you know, I really thought it was cool that you guys are pulling in the CrossFit stuff and the physical fitness piece as well. Because one of the things that I yeah. saw, and I think you, you mentioned that you'd seen this as well growing up, was that a lot of the martial arts instructors were super tough guys, you know, really, uh, really cool, very calm in a lot of ways. They knew their technique, but a lot of times they had, a, you know, a beer belly on them uh, or yeah. some kind of, they were just out of shape. They couldn't probably run a, a quarter mile. And right. Uh, there's, there seems to have been for whatever reason, more of a focus on, Hey, let me get good with technique. Uh, I can whoop anybody as long as I can, you know, uh, as, as long as I can know my technique, but tell me about why you guys, and particularly why you thought bringing in the physical fitness piece was so important. Yeah, there's, um, you know, we, we talked about this a little bit, you know, leading up to this, but that's huge. It's still that way. It's a little less so in a, in a lot of the places now. And I think that's more kind of a testament to the popularity of, you know, MMA and, and BJJ and, and systems like Krav Maga that are more about like general overall take care of yourself. But, you know, it, I would say it's actually twofold why you used to find guys that had big old beer bellies. And one of it was kind of like that false confidence. Like, look, I'm the champion. I got my black belt. I got nothing else to do they stop there. You know, yeah. I hit my goal. I'm ninth dawn of, you know, whatever, you know, I hate to say it, but you know, imaginary system where I, I beat up a bunch of guys on one day and they stop trying to progress themselves in general. We implement the physical fitness stuff to keep people in that zone to keep people pushing. Cause you know, if I go to black belt and I stop there and that's all I've got, then I don't really have a lot of incentive to continue to train or to get better. It's a, it's a terrible mentality to have. So I don't, I don't, I could care less if they said, you know, look, Hey, I'm, you know, I got my black belt in karate. Now I'm going to go pursue a black belt in jujitsu. And then I'm going to go pursue a black belt in this. That's cool. As long as you keep yourself moving and you keep getting better, that's awesome. For us, we implement the physical fitness again, for two reasons. First off, now 
okay, cool, I got my black belt. How do I keep myself motivated? Well, in the mm-hmm. same exact facility right next door, you can never be done training the way we train. So let's say you hit, you know, like a 265-pound power clean. Well, then we're training for you to eventually hit 270 and then training yeah. for you to eventually hit 275. So there's kind of this never-ending cycle of, okay, what's the next thing for me to do? You know, I suck at gymnastics. Let me work on my gymnastics. I suck at, you know, running, rowing, biking, my monostructural stuff. So I'm going to go out and I'm going to get better at that. So it helps create that kind of that desire and that burn and that passion to continually get better. If you start getting burnt out in one area, then there's something else we can push you at. Yeah. That's if you really look good. at it from a, yeah, if you look at it from a self-defense standpoint in general, here's what people don't want to admit, or most self-defense instructors don't want to admit Defending yourself is not complicated. It's not. It's a very simple, simple concept. It's a very simple idea. And we'll dive into this a little more when we talk about active shooter stuff. But it comes down to don't be there. So if you are there, you need to be able to run, get away. If you are there and you can't run away, you need to be able to keep somebody away from you. And if you can't keep away from you, you need to be prepared to get into essentially what's going to be the most physical fight of your life. It's one where, you know, if somebody's coming in and they're just, trying to steal my wallet or something like that, you know, I'm just going to give my wallet. But if I'm talking about somebody that jumps in the back alley, pulls a knife on me, you know, pulls a gun, starts shooting. If I'm a, you know, a female and somebody's sneaking into my house with, you know, the, the intent to rape me in any way, shape or form, I'm about to get into a physical fight. Yeah. Technique is fantastic and it's wonderful. And the more you have your head wrapped around technique and the more naturally the technique comes out of you, it's going to help. But the fact of the matter is, your adrenaline starts pumping. You start losing a lot of feeling and function and some of those finer motor movement type patterns. You start losing grip on your fingers. Things where, you know, other people will go and, oh, well, here's our joint locks and our ankle locks, all that kind of stuff. Man, all that stuff's fine and good until your hands stop working. Or if I get into a knife situation and I do get cut, well, now I need to account for the fact that now I've got blood involved, so that makes things slippery and slick to hold on to. Now I might be losing function, losing something out of a muscle. If I break something, you know, I get swelling and things I need to keep into consideration. What trumps all of that and is always going to make you better is just general physical fitness. If I got a guy that's 280 pounds of sheer muscle with 20% of the technique of a black belt, he is going to be one hell of a fight compared to somebody that's got nine black belts under their belt but, you know, it's 170 pounds with a beer belly and a bad knee. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, right. So when you're looking at self-defense, I would rather my students be able to run 400 meters fast as hell, which means if you pull a knife out on me and I can out-sprint you for 400 meters, yeah. I'm, I'm already self-defense. Like, that's awesome. If I can throw or if I can run that 400 meters and you happen to catch up with me, but I still have the wind now to fight you, yeah, that's even better. You know what I mean? It's if you don't have physical fitness, I don't care what your technique is. You're going to go down because I'm going to outlast you. That's just not the way it is. Yeah. I'm one of those guys that when I go into jiu-jitsu tournaments, I'm like, let me just get through the first three minutes. When you get tired, I'm going to still be here, and now yeah. I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to take over. You know what I mean? So That's awesome. You can't get away from that stuff. If I need to move you know, a, a heavy object off of my kid or off of my wife because, you know, I, we were in a place where there was a tornado or a bad car accident or something and it falls over yeah. and I'm the dude who hasn't been lifting. I'm not going to be there and I'm not going to have those skills when I, when I get to that situation. It's, and taking care of yourself and being alive is so much more than, you know, knowing how to throw fancy back kicks and spinning arm bars. It's, it's about keeping yourself healthy, keeping yourself moved and being very well-rounded. That's really good. And I, I think you brought up a really good point too, is that a lot of people think about, I'm going to go and I'm going to learn martial arts so that I can learn how to defend myself against a person or multiple people. Uh, but really physical fitness is about how can I protect, how can I save my life regardless of the situation yeah. or maybe save the lives of somebody oh, else. Yeah. So like you said, tornado, terrorist attack, whatever it happens to be, uh, there may be a mm-hmm. situation that I need to get out of and it's going to require me to pick my kid up and you know run a hundred yards with them. Or, or whatever Absolutely. the case is, or, or somebody else. And uh, yeah. and I think, you know, we really have got to be training with that sort of mindset of just well-rounded, um, you know, yeah. physically fit. Well, the, the, other, the other spectrum of that is when you're talking about self-defense, you have to go into it with some type of an assumption that there is a chance that you will get injured in some form or fashion. Yeah. So if I go through this whole entire thing and I, I make it out alive and I did my defense properly, but... You know, I took a bunch of big old knife gashes and wounds and things like that. Well, now we're talking post-fight 
in the hospital being able to recover, mm. you're going to recover better. You're going to have a higher, you know, higher likelihood of getting out of that. You're going to have a higher psychological standpoint. You're going to be so much stronger getting through those things if you've prepared your body to be able to do that. And if you're, you know, run down, pre-diabetic, you know, train wreck that's been drinking like crazy, you know, you might get out of that situation alive and you might be able to go tout about how, you know, your background and such and such system helped you. But while you're fighting, you know, in an ICU to come back from a couple of bullet wounds or a knife stab, you know, you're, you're going to be in a world of hurt and a lot worse off for both psychologically and physically from that end. So it's just, you, you cannot defeat that aspect of if your body's not healthy and moving, you're not working at your highest potential. That's just the way it is. I think you're the first person I've ever he heard make that connection. Um, that's yeah. really awesome. Very good. Very good. I, I think sometimes there's a concern, though, for people who say, I want to get, you know, I want to lift, I want to get big and strong, um, but I also want to do martial arts, that there's, uh, that that uh, the lifting and stuff hampers your flexibility and your speed. How does that work out mm -hmm. for you guys? Do you, do you see that as an issue, or is that just you're kind of working two sides of, of things and it, 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 it all makes, it all works out? In, in yeah, a, it, it's, here's the thing, it depends on your goals. Now, look, if, if, if we're talking about, I want to be the best power lifter in the world, for me to be the best power lifter in the world, I have to give up in other places. That is fact. Yeah. If I want to be the best distance runner in the world, I have to give up in other places. The best place to look is just watch the Olympics. Watch the Olympics, watch the different athletes, and look at their body types. So when you talk about, like, specificity, I have a goal. This is the goal that I want to achieve. Whatever my main goal is, I, I work towards that main goal. You know, if you want to be the best power lifter in the world, I'll teach you how to fight severely inflexible, and we'll just understand the pros and cons of your training. You might be a little bit slower. You might be a little less flexible. I understand that. So now how do I fight inside of the parameters of what I want to do? Um, you know, if I have a gymnast and they need to be flexible and they need to really understand how their body's moving, you have to take away from certain aspects here. You're going to be strong and well-rounded and moving your body, but if we were to get, you know, better and bigger in these areas, we might lose that stuff. So, so, you know, the fact of the matter is when you talk about self-defense, how much flexibility do you really need in that stuff? Like you said, the era of, you know, traditional martial arts and the fancy stuff you saw mm -hmm. in movies made it out that, oh, man, I got to work on flexibility. I got to be able to kick people in the head. I got to be able to do that. I got to be able to do this. And the fact of the matter is in real life, you know, somebody breaks into your house or two or three guys break into your house in the middle of the night. Do you need the flexibility and movement of, you know, a Taekwondo specialist, or do you need the flexibility and movement of, you know, a top tier wrestler? Right, right. <laughs> it really comes down to body control and strength and all that kind of stuff. So you don't need this high end flexibility. I don't need to be the strongest guy in the world. I don't need to be the fastest sprinter. We're essentially making you generally physically prepared, which is kind of, you know, if you look back at what CrossFit is, that's kind of like their yeah. estimate. I'm making you pretty darn good at everything. I'm not making you amazing at any one thing. So self-defense is the same exact way. If I can't run away, that limits a lot of my options. Um, you know, if I'm not flexible at all and I can barely turn my shoulder around, well, then that's going to limit the amount of power and things I can do. But if I don't have the flexibility to kick one in the, anybody in the head, it's really not killing me at the end of the day. So if you look at the Olympics and you look at the different kind of standards of who you're looking at, if you look at the difference between the one mile runners and you look at the difference between the hundred meter sprinters and all that kind of stuff, the hundred meter sprinters are jacked, big freaking legs, tons of muscle ripped head to toe. And your long distance runners that are running really, really well for a mile are, you know, emaciated. They're small, they're yeah. tiny. It's built for what they're doing. But if you were to take your 100-meter sprinter and put him next to your one-mile runner and go, which one of these guys would I rather fight, I guarantee you most people are going to look at the sprinter. So with that, you have you know the body, you have the muscle form, you have the strength and the power on the back end of it. That's what we're looking to do. I'm not looking to run a marathon. It's not like I'm going to walk down the street and have to fight 30 people individually. I've got to learn to be able to go off like a bomb for you know 20 seconds, 30 seconds, maybe a minute, maybe two minutes and then be able to function, keep my breath and my air about me to move on to the next thing or move on to the next safe place. I don't need to be kind of casually moving my way through 500 people. So really, if you look at it, you don't need a ton of flexibility. Um, you don't need those big stretcher crazy machines that we used to have back yeah, in the day. Yeah, I remember those, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah if, you, if you've got 
what would be considered, you know, acceptable and healthy range of motion of your knees, hips, arms, something that if you went into a PT, they said, yeah, you know, you're good to go. You're average. That's just all you need. If I'm going to kick somebody, I'm going to be stomp kicking them in the knee or I'm going to be kicking them in the groin or I'm going to kick them in the head but because they're bent over. I'm not really going to be, you know, in need of any intense flexibility for any plausible situation that I'm going to run into. That's really good. And I think that's, you know, uh, there was a lot of good probably that all the movies that we watched growing up did for uh, did for the sport and all that. But there's probably a lot of things we've got to undo as well. I remember, you know, watching oh, Jean-Claude yeah. Van Damme get stretched out by ropes and... Uh, I think Chuck Norris yep. had his own like pair of jeans that you could buy that that had like an extra crotch lining or something so that you could kick higher. Yeah, it was like uh, kicking yeah. jeans or something like that, like something along those lines. Yeah, I mean, that stuff was sweet. It there's was a, really sweet. There's nothing wrong yeah. with it. Don't don't get me wrong. I like when we spar. Like if I'm in like a loose sparring mm-hmm. match, I still like every now and again I kind of test the waters to see if I can still kick somebody yeah. in the head. And I'm not a tall guy in general. I'm I'm like right. five eight on a good day. But, you know, I'll test the waters, and I won't lie, you know, when, when I'm in the area where I'm squatting 400 pounds, it's definitely a little more of a struggle to kick somebody in the head. But, you know, again, the reality of it is, you know, if I'm squatting 400 pounds, that's pretty good strength. If I can still kick you in the ribs, I'm yeah, good to go. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'll take that trade off that doesn't bother me. But look, man, if you're super flexible, that doesn't mean you can't be strong. And if you're strong, it doesn't mean you can't be super flexible. I know a guy named uh, Kevin Cornell. He's a He's a – super heavy. He was a one Oh five plus weightlifter and he's based out of mm-hmm. Pittsburgh and uh, he's a big dude, you know, and you look at him and you be like, oh, okay, cool. You know, he's got Olympic weightlifter flexibility. That dude can do a full like side split and then lean his head all the way down to the ground and have somebody sit Jeez. on it. And he can clean and jerk heck of a lot more than any of us can clean and jerk. And he is not a skinny guy at well, all. You know, you can yeah. do, you can have both. You know, you just got to know where to put your time. But at the end of the day, you don't need it. You know, I don't need a massive amount of flexibility to, to get things sure. done. Not like the old sure. days. Well, that's good. That's good to know. Um, because my flexibility has definitely gone downhill you know, over the years. <laughs> I, look, it, it, that's an uphill battle, man. <laughs> Every day you train, you just get tighter and you know you, you start getting yeah. older. I used to have friends all the time that would, you know, say, "Oh man, wait till you hit 30. And I'm, I'm about six weeks away yeah. from thirty, and I'm going, "Oh my God, I, I, I know what it's, I'm getting there." It's like, holy yeah. crap! But you just, you kind of accept it and you move on. Then you learn how to fight like an old man. That's exactly. how it is, which doesn't involve much. <laughs> <laughs> Let's jump over into the uh, the active shooter training because I think that's probably the yeah, most sure. timely idea. Uh, I think this is something that should be done in every state in every city, you know, as, as much as possible Agreed. because we've got, <clears throat> we're in a, a, a place now where most of us have, you know, not personally witnessed, but witnessed through the news. Some people personally attacks and things from terrorists, uh, even from kids in schools, whatever the case might be, things that used to just be for the movies or things that used to just take place in other countries is coming here and it's been here for a while. Um, yeah. and, you know, we're not yeah. doing nearly enough to get ready for it. And there's a prevailing notion that if something scary is going down, that there's an authority somewhere else that's going to come and rescue me. And I think that that's so yeah. dangerous. And I think it's unmanly for one, but I also think that it's super mm-hmm. dangerous for us to have that kind of mindset. So what is the active shooter course like? And what, what would somebody expect to kind of get from, uh, from taking that? Well, so you pretty much hit the nail on the head. Um, You know, our approach with a lot of this stuff going out there and doing it is it's not a complicated approach to dealing with an active scenario. The course itself is more about telling people you're responsible for your own safety. End of story. Nobody else. Um, You know, one of the first things that I tell people when we're doing kind of like the introductory lecture portion is, I don't know if you know this, but law enforcement is not there to protect you. They're there to end the threat. They're there to enforce laws. This person is breaking the law by trying to kill a bunch of people. They're there to put that guy down. They're not there to protect you. They've got one goal, one goal only when they show up on scene. That's to make sure that guy stops shooting people. They don't come to the door going, you know, oh, man, I'm going to go protect Paul. You know what I mean? It's it's not how it works. So even though they're showing up eventually when they can get there as fast as they can get there, they're not there to protect you. They're there to stop that guy. So you, you have to understand that. The other end of that is most people, they kind of do that little outside of it. Well, the fact of the matter is police response, if you're lucky, depending on where you're at, 
we're looking at 10 to 15 minutes. You know, here in Columbus, you might be able to get something under 10 yeah. minutes, depending on how fast they received the call, how fast they were able to pinpoint exactly where it was if they got the right information, and how fast and how near the, you know, the nearest uh, officer was going to be at. Some law enforcement departments, especially with active shooter scenarios, um, still do kind of like a two-man search or a three-man search. Mm -hmm. You know, a lot of them nowadays are on to just a one-man, first person on scene goes looking for the bad guy in the story. But there's still some some, uh, departments here and there that are looking for two. So now it's not about who's the first guy to get on scene. Now it's how fast can we get two officers Mm -hmm. on scene? Well, whether it's one minute, three minutes, five minutes, ten minutes, fifteen minutes, the fact of the matter is, I can do a hell of a lot of damage to a lot of yeah. people in a very short period of time. Um, you know, speaking of Ryan Hoover specifically, he did a demo uh, actually in Cleveland, Ohio, where he took a bunch of um, plastic trash bags, put them over in a corner, like a basic lockdown procedure you'd see at a, a local yeah. school. And he told the guy behind Airsoft, he didn't tell him what was going on in the room. He just said, I want you in and out of the room in 10 seconds, doing as much damage as you can possibly do. And the guy got in and out of the room, and I think it was like sub nine. It was like eight point seven seconds, and he was on. He was able to unload into sixteen out of eighteen, Jeez. you know, bags or quote unquote yeah. students. You yeah. know what I mean? That's ten seconds. So by the time I start shooting and you recognize what's going on, ten seconds, I've already taken care of sixteen people. Yeah. Yeah. You know what I mean? Well, now I got another, you know, four minutes and fifty seconds to do the rest of my work. People don't think like that. You know, they think, oh, bad things happen. I need to shut down. I need to lock down. I need to go and, and put myself in service somewhere until somebody else mm-hmm. can show up. That's not always an option. So the course itself is about, you know, teaching people this is your job and a story. You know, it's you can choose not to do it. That's fine. But if you choose not to do it and things go bad, it's nobody's fault exactly. but your own. So 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year, you're the only person that is responsible for your own safety. And if you don't understand that, that's on you. That's not on us. So the course is more about that. Now, we're able to relay that information, you know, in in a very realistic manner. We understand how people think. But the course is about getting people to actually understand that. As far as the actual material goes, I mean, this is not complicated stuff. It's, you know, psychologically, it's very scary. It's very hard you know, to wrap your head around the fact that you might have to tackle another person, that you might have to actually kill that person. But when it comes down to the movements and things that you're going to find in a lot of these courses, and especially ours, they're simple. They're stupid simple, man. It's, like I said earlier, if I can get away, I get away. You know, we always want to run. I don't ever want to fight. If I can leave, I leave. Whether that's through, you know, an exit that's right near me, whether I bash a window out, whatever I have to do, I would prefer to get out of the building and get away to safety. If I can't do that and I find myself in a position where I can keep the bad guy away from me, whether it's, you know, putting myself and concealing myself somewhere, whether it's finding cover that will stop bullets, whether it's putting myself in a room where I can barricade, whatever it is to temporarily keep that person away from me long enough for me to eventually reach safety, I do it. But if I can't do either of those, then I have to understand that there's a high likelihood that it's better for me to fight than it is for me to just blindly fall over or blindly turn and run and not have a game plan or a purpose. So if I'm the first person right there and I'm within five feet of the guy, he stomp kicks the door in, comes in and starts shooting. He didn't shoot me. I'm right there. What are exactly. my options? Yeah. I turn and run and I can possibly get shot in the back. I can drop down on the floor and cower down and just hope to God he doesn't see me and possibly get shot. Or I can run at him, still possibly get shot. But at least I'm putting the results of this in my hands and not in somebody else's. You know, that's the mentality. That's the idea behind it. So the course starts off, you know, we we talk about the basic idea, the basic plan. We review a lot of, you know, kind of the FBI and DHS statistics as far as how these things are going down, what people need to do. We talk about different tactics for running and barricading. But then it's hands-on. You know, we get right into it. We teach them how to strike. We're going to teach them how to create, you know, damage, you know, elbows, palm strikes, hammer fists. When would they maybe throw knees if they did? We start learning to pin people up against the walls and develop power on striking. We start learning to pin people to the floor and develop striking. Once they feel pretty comfortable with the idea of creating damage, then we start talking about, okay, now what do I actually do about the threat? So now when they come in, I generally tell people there's two steps. If you want to generalize this, two steps. I want to immobilize the threat the best I can. So a guy running around with a gun is scary. He can freely move. He can aim where he wants. If I can limit his movement, 
that's a good step in the right direction, yeah. right? So whether I pin him up against a wall, whether I wrap my arms around the gun so that he can't freely move the gun, whether I wrap up his legs and tackle him to the floor, step one is to stop his free movement. Once I get done with that, step two is literally put the guy down and don't ever let him get back up. End of story. So whether that means beating him in the head with a fire extinguisher, gouging out an eye, you know, stomping on his head, whatever I've got to do, I make sure that guy doesn't get back up again. And it's not complicated. Yeah. It's very sure. simple. Wrap the guy up, beat him until he doesn't move again. But psychologically, they need the permission to do that. They need to understand that is their duty and their job if they have no other option. And they need to understand that they are actually capable of yeah. doing it. It doesn't take magic. You don't have to be a big, strong fighter. You don't have to have 20 years of experience in martial arts to I do I like it. the way you said that. You're wrapping a dude up. and you're. I like the way him. you said that about they need permission to do that. And I think that's really true. I think that's the thing that people are missing yeah. is that they, they need the permission to say, hey, it's, it's okay to actually defend yourself and to hurt someone else if it means saving your life and saving the life of others. Um, we think that that's right. the job for somebody else to do. You know, people who are properly trained. Right. Well, and... Go ahead. Yeah, that and if you look at it, you know, we were all raised day one, you know, don't mm -hmm. hit people, don't throw a first punch, you know, they when they hit you, you can hit back, that's self-defense, and you're taught so much, hitting people is bad, hitting people is bad, hitting people is bad, that's not the right message, it's when warranted and when you have no other choice, hitting people might be necessary, and you have permission to do it, and you are capable of doing it, and that's the message that needs to be put that's out good. there, you know, we don't want to fight. But if we do find ourselves in a situation where we have to, then you have no other choice. You know, um, you know again, you know, going back to Ryan and some of the other guys that teach these things, you know, one of the things that, that Ryan said the last time we were out there we were training was, you know, when you're talking about accountability and you're talking about your ability to go in and why you might have to do these things, you got to remember, you didn't show up that day and start shooting yeah. people. So it's not your fault if you lose a student. It's not your fault if you had to put a guy down. It's not your fault if somebody that you know or somebody in the area got hurt, it's not your fault. You're not the one who came in that day and said, I'm going to ruin a bunch of people's lives yeah. today. You dealt with what was given to you. You took the information that was presented to you. You took the resources you had available to you, and you made the best freaking decision that you could possibly make under those type of circumstances. That's what you really need to understand. It's not so much about, you know, I talk about this all the time in our courses, but there's no right or wrong to this. You know, you, you can sit back and Monday morning quarterback mm -hmm. all you want, and as instructors, we have to do that because we want to break it down. We want to know what works. We want to know what didn't work. We want to see how people are reacting. But the fact of the matter is nobody can sit there and say, you did yeah. that wrong because we weren't there. We don't know the information you processed. I don't know if it sounded like the gunshots came from the left mm -hmm. or from the right, and that's why I ran that direction. I don't know how my body locked up. I don't know what happened. I don't know my emotional connection to anybody mm -hmm. in there. That's yeah. tough. So you can't Monday morning quarterback it. There's no right or wrong. There's the information that was presented to you. There's the resources you had available to you, and you made the best decision you could possibly make. The problem is most people's decision right now, because they weren't taught otherwise, is to lock down, curl up, and hope to God they don't die. And that is not right. That's where we go in and we change and we start to modify this and go, look, this stuff. Yeah. This is a terrible, terrible place for you to find yourself in. But the fact of the matter is, you have no other choice in this instance. You better be prepared to fight back. And if you decide not to, again, that's on you. You are accountable for that. Wow. And that's it. That's really good. I'm wondering, too, um, I don't know if you guys do this in your course, but uh, do, does, do you guys give the people a chance to hear live gunfire? Um, um, okay. Close-ish. So there's a couple of different variations of the course. The main one you're going to get into, just because you got to understand the constraints of uh, trying to get out and get to people as much as possible. So we teach these um, for the general public for free once a month at our facility here in Columbus. So every month there's a free one listed on our website. We cap it at 40 people. Um, we usually end up with like 50. But, um, you know, it, we open that one for free. We also go out and we travel and we teach these things in a lot of places. So we've, uh, you know, just in January, we were at a university in um, Oregon. We've been in uh, Pittsburgh. We've been up in Cleveland. I've got seminars scheduled for Miami. I've got seminars scheduled for uh, Denver and Arizona. So we get out a lot. When you go into those places, you're constrained to what you have access to immediately and what they'll let you do. So when we do them at our, you know, at our course, 
I don't care if the wall gets shot up with, you know, blue paintballs and, and, you know, sim rounds and stuff like that. I'm not worried about noise violations. So we have, um, we have simulation, you know, force on force guns. We have a AR and we have a, you know, fully functional Glock. So we do an entire section on, this is how the gun yeah. operates. Understand how the gun operates, understand how it fails. Um, you know, your semi-automatic handguns generally have a, you know, an, an outer, um, slide. I can mess with that. I can cause a malfunction in a gun very easily with that. Here's how I do it. We demonstrate a bunch of ways to cause malfunctions with a live firing sim gun that operates the same exact way that the Glock would. Then we pull out an AR that's converted for sim rounds and we do the same exact thing with that. Hey, look, this one has an internal bolt. It's a little different than the slide, although it operates the same way. Here's what you can look at if we're blocking ejection port, if this gets hit, blah, 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 going on from there. So we do a whole understand the gun. You know, if you understand the gun, then I can start to see where maybe the gun can fail and I can start to see where the gun might not be magic and I might survive. So we're, we're educating people on it. Inside of that, we've got, uh, they're called just combat blanks, but they're essentially one of the highest decibels we can get to without making everybody put on your right. pro. So, you know, it's a, it's a pretty loud bang. It's, it definitely scares the living crap out yeah. of a lot of people. <laughs> but, uh, you know, it's about as close as you're going to get with that. Now, we do have um, a course that we're actually hosting. It's going to be more of an instructor development one. So people that want to get in and they want to help the movement and get out there and help people, we're hosting a three-day course in September at our facility. And we're actually teaming up with um, one of the other owners of Endeavor, but he's also a very well-known guy, um, Rob Pincus, who's a big firearms instructor that a lot of people know love him or hate him. But um, he's probably, you know, in my opinion, from my experience, he's one of the best guys that talks directly to defensive firearms and the realities behind it. And he's not afraid to do it. And he's not jumping through hoops trying to make people happy about it. You know, he'll have a very direct conversation. This is the reality of using that gun. With that one, we'll have some actual legitimate live fire training going on in that course. Um, and you'll be able to actually get out there and run some drills that might be a little more applicable to a concealed carry operator inside of those circumstances and things along those lines. They get a little live fire through that. Um, they can also join into some of our live fire courses. So with that, they'll get that little live action with a gun. When we do the general public ones or I go into a school or I go into a medical facility or anywhere else, there's really not that opportunity to do that. So we get as close as we can with those combat blanks and giving them a little bit of a sense of realism. And then we just educate them on the fact that, look, if you've never shot a gun, I don't care if you want to own one. I'm not sitting here telling you you need to conceal carry. I'm telling you right now that you should get around them a little bit, understand how they work, shoot them a couple of different times so you at least understand what they sound like, what they yep. smell like, and what they yeah. feel like. So you're not sure. Exactly. That's, that's exactly what happens is you, know, you take anybody to the gun range for the first time. I don't care if you're wearing... Uh, you know, you got your ear, ears on, you're going to get shocked. You know, it, mm -hmm. it's the amount of power yeah. and the, just the quickness of the explosion. Um, it just, you know, it just yeah. instinctively sends something through you that freaks you out. Um, and, and so, yeah, yeah. people def well, need you know, to get around that. Yeah, it's, it's just, you know, it's fear-based ignorance is what it is. And it's not, you know, not ignorance like, oh, you're ignorant. But the fact of the matter is, if you've never been around something, then it's scary. And especially if you've never been around a gun, mm -hmm. And all you've ever done is watch really, really, really bad movies and, you know, terrible media coverage on what guns do to people. In your mind, you're going, holy shit, this gun shows yeah, up. You got a cannon, right? <laughs> I'm screwed. Everybody in the room is dead. Yeah. yeah, you know, and that's just not how it works. I mean, it, there's a lot of things that can go wrong with a gun. There's a lot of openings. So getting them out there, educating them, you know, and just saying, look, this is where these things can fail. They're not magic. They're not magic in any way, shape, or form. Let's talk about it. Let's let's break off the boundaries. Let's not try to make anybody happy. Let's go brass tacks. This is how this gun is going to operate. This is how you can shut it down. And we're not discrediting the lethality of it because you might get shot in the process. But the fact of the matter is, A, B, C, D are ways that you could take care That's of that really weapon. Good. All right, Aaron, I got one last question for you here. Um, you, you pretty much do as a job, but I think it's probably every 13-year-old kid's dream. At least it was when I was a kid, right? Uh, and every guy out here is, yeah. is listening to this is thinking, man, I wish I had this guy's job. Where did I go wrong? You know, stupid college. <laughs> but, uh, what does it mean to you as a man, you know, in your heart of hearts to, to teach the skills that you do, to do what you do and to help people learn the things that, uh, that you're teaching? Yeah, I mean, that's a great question. It's, uh, to answer your first question, 
if you want to do this stuff full time, just be willing to not make a lot of money. <laughs> it's, you gotta love it and, you know, work long hours and all that kind of stuff. But no, nah, I joke, man. It's a, it's, it's truly a passion. I, you know, when, you, when anybody, anytime anybody pulls out kind of like, you know, the, the man card and like, Hey man, let's just look at you as a man sure. and that kind of thing. You know, me personally, I, when I relate back to anything manly, I, you know, I always think of my grandfather, my grandfather, Anybody who knows me, they've they've heard the story of my grandfather. He was a World War II vet. Um, he was just he was that guy. You know, I'm 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 Italian. I got a little Dago family. So he was, you know, I tell people he was a little he was a lot of Dago, you know, a lot of respect. He was like the non mafia, you know, kind of godfather yeah. in, in New Middletown, which is a little small area out here. Everybody looked up to him, everybody loved him. Um, well, you know, you know, my father was an abusive alcoholic and so he stepped in, he was my mom's dad he stepped in and, and took care of us. You know, he was the father figure. He was the one you looked up to. He was the one that he was the stern hand when it was needed. So I always think back of like to him, you know, anytime I look at that and, you know, he was always about helping people, you know, no matter what it was, no matter how dirty he had to get his hands, you know, you, you did it yourself. You wanted to build something, he built his own house. You need to fix a car. You figured out, learn how to fix your own dang car. You know, you're a, you're a thousand dollars short. Don't look to anybody else. Go to somebody else or go somewhere. Find out how you're going to make that thousand dollars. You know, it's on you. You're the man of the house. This is our job. It's our responsibility. So it wasn't about him. It was always about what do I do to make everybody else's life better? And, you know, for me, when I look at that stuff, you know, especially now, you know, four weeks in having a kid, all I can think about the whole entire way is, you know, how do I lead the way? How do Mm -hmm. I guide that? So it's from a man standpoint, it's, going out there and how do I make everybody else's life better? You know, how do I take from the physical fitness side of things? I'm not looking to create the next CrossFit Games champion or anything like that. How do I take a lady that has had two hip surgeries and a shoulder surgery and I get her to a point where she's got quality of life where she can run around with her grandkids and feel really good when she wakes up in the morning and maybe add five or 10 years to her life. You know, how do I give, you know, a, a lady the confidence to possibly get out of a domestic violence or, you know, style kind of abusive relationship you know, how do I take this kid that's, you know, been just getting bullied around and be and teach him how to respectfully take care of that situation and be there? You know, how am I going to present myself to my son where he understands that no matter what's going on, you got to figure out how to do it yourself. You got to, you know, move yourself through it. There's nothing wrong with reaching out and getting information from other people, but again, you're accountable for it. So I always think back, you know, to yeah. that. I want to be that guy where people go, man, you know, he really made a positive impact on my life in this way. And, you know, man, if I ever needed to call out to somebody, he's the guy to do it. Um, you know, I, I always look at it from that standpoint. That's why we try to give back, you know, as many free trainings as we can. We're not looking to pillage people and take their money. We just try to cover our expenses. We try to get out. We try to reach as many people as we can. We try to do, you know, just good by the community and good by the public. And, you know, it's, we, we all know this. There's plenty of tough freaking ladies yeah. out there that can pull the man Absolutely. Just, just as well as yeah. we can. But, um, you know, I'm, I'm just old school at heart, man. And I'm always that, you know, you're the head of the house. You take care of your people. You take care of the people around you. you be somebody that, you know, can be reliable to somebody else. And when people need you, you, you take care of them when you can. And to me, I, I feel this is what I do best. And this is the way that I can give back to people, both from a skill set standpoint and then just from kind of a conceptual outlook about, you know, being accountable for yourself. And I think that's really where, I kind of resonate back to that kind of man thing. I always look and go, you know, would, would pops be proud? Is this something that he'd want? You know, am I doing something that, that he would have done? And that's kind of how I correlate everything I do. So this is my skill set. This is what I'm good at. This is what I'm insanely passionate about. And it's no fun hoarding that to myself. I want to get out there and I want to be able to make a positive impact on other people that way as well. That's really good. Really, really good. Plus it's pretty badass when you can put somebody in <laughs> That is for. pretty badass. Yeah. <laughs> Impress your friends by hurting somebody. Um, <laughs> yeah right. Well, it sounds like you got an awesome example from your grandfather there, and it sounds like just talking to you and, and seeing the things that I've seen about what you're up to, man, that you're setting a great example yourself. And so I, I think that's really great, and you're to be commended on the work that you do. Um, I appreciate that, man. I really do. Aaron. I really appreciate you being on the on the podcast and and for taking the time to talk with me and uh, and for sharing your story and for giving us a lot of great insights into how we can better defend ourselves and uh, and hopefully, man, we'll see this kind of stuff and maybe see you um, showing up in our towns so that we can take some of these courses ourselves. Yeah. Yeah. If anybody's, you know, looking for it, we're more than willing to train and travel. Um, you know, they can visit the website, EndeavorDCF.com. We've got a little active shooter page there. 
Um, like I said, if you're in the Charlotte area, Ryan runs courses all the time, and, and he runs a really good active shooter course as well. He's a good guy I would definitely recommend checking out. Um, if you can get out and visit, you know, Rob Pincus, he's another phenomenal one. It's it's not enough. You know, I'm not enough to be able to get out there and touch everybody. So there's we want to make sure that people know there's a lot of really good resources out there. Find the guy that's going to look you in the eyes and tell you that this is going to suck, but this is how you get it done, and, and you're pretty much in the awesome. right place. Great. All right, sir. Thank you so much. No problem, Michael. Well, I appreciate your time, man. All right, men. Let's go out there and get trained up. One of our first roles as men is to be protectors, and we can't do that with the skills we don't have. Thanks again to Aaron Janetti for sharing his time and his knowledge with us. And until next time, keep your powder dry, and may a fair wind be always in your sails. <laughs>